actually looks like this was made for um, a book from 1659. And uh, yes, so, all right. So I would like to say that this could be called transmissions, transcriptions, translations, transmutations, transformations, and transgressions of the transnational Edward Kelly because he was very transitory. So this is the book, 1659, where his image appeared with John Dee and Paracelsus and several other characters from alchemy. And this book was published by uh, Merrick Casabon to be a warning not to delve into the spirit world. And in turn, it, it basically laid the foundation for lots of misnomers about John Dee and Edward Kelly throughout history. And most people didn't know about John Dee and Edward Kelly's angelic diaries and all this stuff until this book was published. And after that, their names were just totally smeared in the mud. And so my goal is to try to take the real evidence that exists in archives and to bring him back to life because most people have just repeated the same mistakes and falsehoods over and over again. So there's a wealth of information hidden in the archives. And uh, I don't know if you can read this, but basically nobody knew what his past was, but uh, in Elias Ashmole's diaries, they found that Kelly's sister told that he was an apothecary, which is quite interesting because it means he grew up learning chemistry and therefore he became an alchemist quite easily. This is the horoscope drawn by John D. He was born, uh, Edward Kelly was born on August 1st, 1555 in Worcestershire, England. He was of Welsh blood, Welsh blood, and he was later knighted as, uh, this is his family seal, which was just published recently. It, uh, he was of the D. Amami family of, uh, it was the Kellys of Imami from Ireland. And uh, he needed this to get knighthood later. He had to prove it. So this is the best book ever written about Edward Kelly. And it's just being republished this year with a lot of additional stuff. It's an Australian researcher. And this, before it was quite hard to find this book. I think once he republishes it, it'll be quite easy. This is another book that was written a few years ago. But this book is full of uh, more lies and legends and lots of uh, new ideas that this guy had. But he died a very interesting death, if you want to research that. He died on the day of his first play about Edward Kelly. He was found uh, dead in Prague in the house that he claimed that Edward Kelly used to live in. But there's no proof of that he owned that house. And so Edward Kelly had transmissions through a crystal ball or an obsidian mirror of angels. And this is the later to be called Enochian language that Edward Kelly received from the angels. And they called it the angelic language, Dee and Kelly did. And for like five years, they were working together as a team to scry these transmissions from the angelic realm using this table, or a table looks somewhat like this. And all this was translated from the angels to Kelly on how to build this. And this is in the British Museum, the stuff they found in a chest that was hidden in the top, along with some of the diaries. And it's not 100% sure that they owned it, but it's pretty, pretty well regarded to be John Dee and Edward Kelly's. And these are some of the, I have so many slides I'm going through quite quickly because I'm hoping some of you, most of you know this already. This is the uh, Sigillum Day that he got from another book but added a bunch of new stuff. And this is what they use to talk to the angels. Along with this crystal ball and the uh, four towers, golden, um, actually it's bronze, Thing. And this is a book written in Czech that this is the best research done in Bohemia where they lived for three years. Uh, it's 
very interesting how this lady was able to find lots of documents in the Czech archives that nobody had ever found before about Dee's, or about Kelly's later life after Dee went back to England. And so John Dee and Edward Kelly lived for three years in this castle and they did alchemical experiments. It's about three hours south of Prague and the um, town is amazing and it's still in almost untouched Renaissance form. I highly suggest you visit. And so these, in their diaries that were found much later after their death, they found, I've cut these two things out because basically nobody could understand why Rudolf II, the emperor of Holy Roman Empire based in Prague, why he gave knighthood to Edward Kelly but it seems to be something about him giving the glass to the emperor. But I found a lot more stuff beyond that because the, um, well first here, there's a document in the British Library in London that is Rudolf II signed giving knighthood to Edward Kelly. So a lot of people have been like, oh, we don't know if, it, if he actually existed, but there's so much archival information that it's undeniable that Edward Kelly was real and not a figment of John Dee's imagination. So, and he actually owned this house in Prague that's called the Faust House. And uh, they recently found these paintings underneath some paint and they were published last year, first time. I, oh, this is weird, okay. He also owned the Men House. It's about 30 minutes south of Prague. It used to be the, the main gold mining town in Bohemia. And after he left this town, Trebon, he moved to this town, Yilave, Uprahi, and he took over this house, it was the old mint. And he was in contact with all of the major mint guys around Bohemia in different mines, because Bohemia was the richest country in Europe during the Renaissance because they had every metal and mineral. So this was, so my main goal was to try to figure out how he was accessing the angelic realm. And this is the first book that proposes that they were possibly using drugs. And it was written by a, a Czech immigre to California who left after the Soviets took over in 68. And he was studying, I, nobody knows where he got his primary information because there was no bibliography in the books he later published. But he, I'm pretty sure he read this document from 1974 about water lilies and, uh, and other things that were being used by the Mayans, and he was thinking that they possibly had drugs from the Mayans or from somewhere in Central or South America. Uh, but he was the first guy to propose this. And then in this book, this book was published in 2011 in Czech and 2015 in English. And it's a giant book, and there's a huge chapter on Edward Kelly. And they mentioned that guy before, but they also mentioned that there's no bibliography, so there's no way to back it up. And then recently, this book was published, Lieber 420. And he had some quotes in there that were from the angelic diaries that they wrote. And it's quite interesting because he only put selected sentences. And I went back and I, I looked at what he was drawing from. And I realized that it's interesting how every time he talks about ointment, he says, but how will you do? I have forgotten all of my drugs behind me. But since I know that some of you are well stored with sufficient ointments, I do enter, intend to visit you only with their help. You see, all my boxes are empty. Edward Kelly, he showeth a great bundle of empty, it's like apothecary boxes and then some to my hearing to rattle. And then uh, he goes on, he's like, shall we go to the apothecary? So the apothecary sold all sorts of different things back then, and it's not quite clear what they were using, but obviously they had some ointments. And then uh, this quote, he's talking about the um, where lies the potion and eternal medicine. You have truly considered, I am just, you believe, for truth and justice, his words and teaching are true and perfect. And basically, he's uh, getting divine inspiration from these potions. And 
here it's uh, this is a very interesting quote. Edward Kelly felt the thing run in his head as the other day it did. Me taketh out the rod from under the table, he said, eternities in Kylo. Upon my saying speech, he said, what wilt thou? The preceding instruction necessary for understanding of the book. And the, um, they keep talking about Edward Kelly having a fire in his head. And it was usually around the time when they were talking about potions. And so in this book, which came out in 2018, I'm doing kind of chronological order of the research that's come out recently. This is a checkbook studying um, gravestones. And Edward Kelly married a widow who had two children. And so his stepdaughter was named Elizabeth Jane Weston. And she spoke five languages. She was a British citizen, but she lived in Prague. And she wrote poetry in Latin. And before Shakespeare, she was the most famous poet in Europe. And it's very interesting because on her, this is her. And this book was published in 2000 with her collective writings. And on her gravestone in Prague, if you look down below, this is her dad and her mother's uh, coat of arms. And in the center, nobody's ever been able to figure out what this was. And they published it. They believe it's Mandrake. And this is the only one in all of Bohemia with Mandrake, only tombstone with Mandrake on it, which I think is very interesting because she was probably witness to the angelic uh, sessions. And these are Rudolf II's Mandrakes. The Mandrake's the oldest known psychedelic. It's in the Bible. And uh, it was used for many different purposes, but it's a very strong hallucinogen. And so at some point, Edward Kelly was locked up in this tower because nobody knows exactly why, but probably because he wouldn't reveal his secrets to Rudolf II. And so he wrote several books to Rudolf II while he's in this tower. And this researcher, Jennifer Rampling, published this book last year. And she had been clued into an archive in uh, Leipzig that has an Edward Kelly manuscript that no one's ever written about before. But it includes the, it was compiled from all of the different writings that he did in that prison tower and sent to Rudolf II. And in, yeah, so basically that's what I said. And here it's very interesting because it says, another recipe apparently acquired for, from Kelly is a secret possessed by his former patron, the oil of Lord Rosenberg. Extracted from the lethargy of gold, this is said to be the same gum with which Rosenberg was used to multiply and incinerate his medicine. The medis medicinal oil expels poison and pestilence, but it can also be used for the great work of the chemist. That is transmutation. When mixed with gold, prepared using the fire against nature or aqua fortis provided. Of course, that the volatile pro product does not escape the vessel. So basically, the, the castle I showed earlier, Trebon, where they lived for three years, this was Lord Rosenberg's castle. And he was the biggest sponsor of alchemy in Bohemia and all of, basically all of Europe at the time until Rudolf II moved to Prague. And so he sheltered these, these two alchemists for three years while the Catholic Church wanted to execute them. And so in the, yeah, so, so she talks a lot about Sericon, the dissolution of Sericon in the sharpest humidity of grapes. And Sericon is known as a red tincture and the, um, so basically, the, he learned this from George Ripley, who was a British alchemist in the, the 15th century. And nobody knows what Sericon was made of, but it's quite interesting because the, yeah, so here's from D. D was talking about Sericon and, um, here, I saw the same on 
8th of February, 1588 in Trebon in Bohemia from two pounds of Sericon dissolved in distilled vinegar and by means of spirit of wine cleansed of much sediment came four, ounce, four ounces of red wine or oil. And so then this is in John Dee's diary. And so the, the Seric, like all the liquid would be dissolved or uh, dissipated through the air and then it would leave this this crystal around the glass. And so that's what's being shown there. And in this, these notes that, or this book that Edward Kelly wrote, he talks about having to light this, this red crystal. And um, basically, yeah, sorry, I think this is too much to read for now, but the, um, it's what I just said. And so here it said, in 1588, uh, just a few months after his Sericon experiment on May 10th, he exclaimed in his diary that Kelly had opened the great secret to him. The revelation marked a further shift in their relationship. And soon after that, they had a, um, he, in one of their angelic sessions, the angel Uriel told Kelly to swap wives with John Dee. And nine months later, Dee's wife had a child and they named him uh, Theodorius Trebonius D because they were living in Trebon. And uh, they soon broke up after that. And D, or, yeah, D went back to Europe or to England and Kelly got knighted and got a castle and nine villages and two houses in Prague and all this other stuff. And then soon after that, he was sent to prison. So there's like, he basically because they think he wouldn't reveal the secret of the Sericon to Rudolf II. And I went and looked at this book in Leipzig and he still wouldn't reveal it even though he was trying to get out of prison. He kept uh, like teasing Rudolf along and eventually he got out of prison. But he was imprisoned again in this castle. And it's quite high above this town, and he ended up dying soon after. Nobody knows how he died. Nobody knows where he's buried. And uh, there's no record after this castle, but supposedly he fell while he was escaping, and he died of injuries from the fall. And uh, yeah, this is an interesting quote. This is about uh, Oswald Kroll, who was an alchemist in Rolf II's Cadre as well, and it, the author mentions Kroll's trip to Bohemia specifically to Most, which is where Kelly was then in prison. During his visit, Kroll attempted to attain his secretum solutionis, likely the secret of the gold tincture. Kelly refused Kroll's request, stating that he was bound by an oath he made to the Lord of Rosenberg from Trebon, who himself purportedly knew the secretum solutionis. Soon thereafter, Kelly died in prison, probably at Christmas in 1597, taking a secret if he possessed any to his grave. And this is a statue at Most Castle of Edward Kelly. And this is something I found when I went to Yilave, next to the house that he used to own, which was sold while he was in prison and was sold to this other alchemist. There's this tombstone, the only tombstone in the whole yard. And I think that it's Edward Kelly's tombstone because nobody has any clue where it is and this makes sense since he lived there before he went to prison, before he died. So here's some sources from some of the information, but basically that's, that's it. And I have more to reveal, but I am not gonna do it now, but maybe in the future I'll publish it or give another lecture here or something. But there's a, it's quite an interesting mystery. I think that the reason why they covered it up so long and maligned them was because they had, they had some secret that they, obviously he got knighted, he got given all this property and lots of stuff. He was doing something and the alchemist always said, the gold that we're seeking is not the gold that you're thinking about. So. How's my time?
that correctly in one of your slides where you were talking about the Saracon, that it was menstrual blood that was put through some type of fire? No. Okay, it didn't say menstrual. It did? I thought there was a word that said menstrual. Okay, maybe, maybe, but... Yeah, because I remember so it said menstruation is bacteria, but it didn't say... It said mercury yeah. menstruation. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah, definitely, because he wrote lots of tracks about alchemy, and he was doing actual alchemy, and the wife swapping is hard to prove or deny, but the, he, they believe he was, a, he was trained as an apothecary, and therefore, maybe he was doing some kind, my personal belief is he was making an ointment that he was putting on maybe when he's shaking their hand or something before they did these angelic sessions and then there was some kind of presence through the ointment because there was, yeah, it's, it's like um, nobody, it's, that's why I say he's a charlatan because nobody could figure out what was going on. It's such a weird, weird situation. But yeah, I don't know about the other. The wife swapping, it's, it's hard to say, but it's interesting that nine months later they had a child and they named him after the city. So, but he died shortly after they went back to England, that child did. Yes? Um, I've got a short comment. Uh, you were saying that you didn't think that it was real gold, it was some other, you know, spiritual gold. Or I didn't say that, that's what the alchemist wrote. Okay. And I'm referring back to a lecture by a guy called John Tinsley in the late 1990s at Leeds University, where he referred to documents from Kelly's son that referred to his, his experience as a child, the famous gold bars. Yeah, that was John D's son, Arthur D. Right, okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, but that was more connected to, possibly connected to the Voynich manuscript because he was, he was looking at some hieroglyphics. That's what... Arthur D. said, okay. some book full of hieroglyphs. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, there was, the, so, so I forgot to mention, but Edward Kelly is one of the few people in history that was reported to have transmuted base metal into gold. And multiple people witnessed it at different times. And so maybe he was pulling their leg and doing some trick, because there are all sorts of ways of trickery with when you melt things, you can you can have like something in your sleeve and you drop it in, and so yeah, maybe. But oh, it could be coded mm -hmm. because this whole concept of deck nomen, it's uh, deck as in cover and nom as name, so cover name. Co the, like the alchemical history is just full of these cover stories, and yeah, there's. Uh, I think it's highly likely it was not just about gold. Mm -hmm. But they, he did get a gold mine. Edward Kelly basically got all this land that was full of gold. Mm -hmm. But it was a spent gold mine. So some people believe that maybe he got rich by taking the processed dirt from the gold mine and then sifting through it to get real gold. But I think it's more of cover names than anything. Yes? Some kind of ointment 
sort of mysterious or like a fluid and they would smear it on the bells mm. that they had to use to call the spirits and mm-hmm. they would go and smear it over things. Yeah, I think that was about 200 years later, but okay. yeah, the, there was definitely a connection because the Rosicrucians started just after Dean Kelly died. And uh, yeah, so a lot of people like Francis Yates wrote about D being the protagonist of the Rosicrucian story. And, um, but maybe it was Kelly. But yeah, it's, it's fascinating that that book, Libra 420, was really the first one that brought up that there are potions in the diaries. And then, but he didn't put the part about the fire in the head. Every time they mentioned a potion, there was always a reference to Edward Kelly had a fire in his head, like right after the potion was mentioned. So to me, it's like, that's pretty, pretty, it's not proof, but it's pretty uh, convincing that they were using some ointments and potions for some kind of effect. I mean, what else would they be doing it for? So, any other questions? Do you think we have to render him either like a charlatan or a real thing? Like, it's kind of a mix, right? He definitely presents things. Yeah, I think it, I think it was both. Yeah. yeah. Because basically, all these guys were coming to Prague to prove themselves so that they could become wealthy. And Edward Kelly was really big into treasure hunting. And a lot of the people back then were into treasure hunting, and that's why they were trying to speak with the angels initially, was to locate treasures. So they were very money hungry, and I think they would do anything to get money. And Edward Kelly was the best in history at doing this, because he went from obscurity to becoming a knight of Bohemian Empire. And um, yeah. It's fascinating how there's been so much connection between Bohemia and England over the centuries, and there was a lot of cross-pollination when Dee and Kelly came with a bunch of books of British alchemists like George Ripley. So, yes. Thank you.